Thank you for attending tonight's educational event. 2020 was supposed to be a very special year in the I world. There were many marketing opportunities in our profession in the year 2020. However, ours and every other profession have taken a back seat to our current pandemic. Bob Dylan's classic, The Times They Are Changing, is spot on in 2020. Virtual education seminars were quite, re were quite rare in the optometric world prior to the pandemic, and now we get COPE credit via a webinar. I am certainly looking forward to a live education, hopefully in the near future, as I'm sure most of you are as well. I certainly have no financial relationships or commercial interests to disclose. Our main goals for this evening are to review most of the procedures and protocol that we already know. We've learned and read about and currently practice many of these concepts. So a review is the best way to describe this lecture. We will review who are candidates for cataract surgery and what symptoms are associated with cat cataracts. We will review a very boring subject, the different types of cataracts. We will discuss how to manage that patient, when to monitor in the office and when to refer. We will discuss the cataract evaluation in the cataract surgeon's office, the pre-op exam, the pre-op education, the pre-op counseling, the post-op care, and possible post-op complications. When we refer uh, for cataract surgery, uh, I try not to use the word surgeon with the patient, as that obviously implies surgery, and that can sometimes put the patient on edge. I educate them regarding cataracts and recommend a cataract consultation with a cataract specialist, who will in turn recommend the best plan of action. We all know the healthy adult eye does not grow in size or shape, which is why vision somewhere after our mid four, our mid twenties remains stable. LASIK works on this premise and and does. I'm sorry, LASIK works on this premise and LASIK does not stop the eyes from changing, but corrects the refractive error that is present. The crystalline lens, however, is constantly adding cells, getting thicker, more dense, and less flexible until it is removed. Webster's definition of a cataract is a clouding of the lens of the eye or its surrounding transparent membrane that obstructs the passage of light. Because of the thickening of the lens, the focal point changes, causing the prescription to change. I refer to this as the quantity of vision. Because of the clouding of the human lens, the quality of vision changes. These changes occur rapidly in some patients, in months, not years, and in others, the changes are quite slow and subtle. So when I define cataracts and educate the patient, I incorporate both the quantity and the quality of vision into my discussion. The typical complaints you will hear from the patient that will trigger you to think cataracts will reference both changes in the quantity in the, of the vision as well as the quality of the vision. Typical patient complaints are halos and starbursts at night, colors are not as sharp and vivid, we need more light when they're, when they're reading, and the overall quality of vision is not like it used to be. We've all heard those complaints in the exam chair. There are many types of cataracts. I will touch on these five. They all cause the same bottom line symptoms that the quality of vision is not as good as in the past. Nuclear sclerosis is the most common type of cataract. It occurs in the nucleus or the inner layer of the eye. It can be very slow developing, sometimes takes more than 20 years from the initial diagnosis to the decision to undergo cataract surgery. Um, it causes a decrease in visual acuity, contrast, and color vision. Uh, nuclear sclerosis is responsible for the term second sight, where typically a habitually uh, myopic patient's prescription becomes less myopic, as the nuclear sclerosis progresses. These patients become less dependent on their distance glasses. This is a change in the quantity of vision, but the quality of vision becomes less acceptable. A cortical cataract forms in the outer layers of the crystalline lens. You will see radial opacities like spokes on a wheel. You can see it in this picture. Um, they also occur due to the aging process. These cortical opacities are very common in diabetics, and the visual complaints are similar, blurred vision, night glare, and changes in contrast. Posterior subcapsular cataracts are opacities that form on the back surface of the lens. They are common in diabetics and steroid users. The slit lamp exam reveals a sheath of tissue beyond the nucleus with varying densities. 
These typically occur in younger patients, uh, younger in the cataract world, 40s and 50s, and the visual symptoms accelerate rapidly, as does a large myopic shift. Visual changes are typically noticed in months, not in years, like they are with nuclear sclerotic cataracts. The large myopic shift can occur in one or both eyes. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had a plano presbyo that six months uh, prior um, was a 2020 uncorrected vision. Um, when I recently saw them, one eye corrected at minus 550 with best corrected visual acuity of 2200, and the other was uh, a minus 250 with about a 2030 or 2040 best corrected acuity. So these accelerate very quickly, and these pa patients are anxious to have surgery to fix their visual problem. A posterior polar cataract is a rare form of congenital cataract. These typically involve the transparent posterior capsule. They are progressive, but typically they cause minimal visual concerns in the younger years. The importance of a posterior polar cataract is due to its high risk of complications during surgery. There's a greater risk of capsular tear due to, due to the adhesions um, of the lens to the posterior capsule. Uh, and this increases the risk of the nucle nucleus dropping into the retina. A pseudo exfoliation cataract occurs from gradual deposits of fibrous residue from the lens and the iris. These deposits attach to the lens, the capsule, and the cornea. These, these patients tend to dilate poorly, have weaker zonules, so the surgeon must account for this during surgery. Careful IOP management must be followed as pseudo -ex exfoliation cataracts can be associated with pressure spikes from the debris. So what do we do? What are our choices when you diagnose a patient with a cataract? One option is to educate the patient and monitor their condition and lifestyle complaints and follow them in six to 12 months. A second option is to change their prescription if appropriate, which would improve their quantity of vision, but may not, may not improve their quality of vision. These patients also need to be monitored in six to 12 months. A third option is to refer to a cataract specialist for a cataract evaluation. My guess is that Ida has made that process very OD friendly. So feel free to call, text, email, or knock on her door anytime and she will ensure that your patient is scheduled for the evaluation. Basically, you wanna gauge the patient's response to your cataract diagnosis. Some will say that they are too young for cataracts no matter what their age is. This is the denial phase. For these patients, as long as they are relatively safe to drive and they can get along and do most of their activities, um, I educate them on what to expect as far as the progression of the cataracts. I tell them cataracts never get better and the regression in the quality of vision and recommend a visit in a year or sooner if needed. Others are quite anxious to achieve a better quality of vision, especially at night. Many of these patients have spouses who have had cataract surgery and thus live with someone who has experienced the benefits. Many of these anxious for cataract surgery already know that there are vision options that can reduce their dependence on glasses, which we would discuss shortly. When we refer for cataract evalu uh, evaluation, one of the important measurements is the corneal curvature. So it is important that soft contact lenses be left out for one week prior to the evaluation and gas permeable lenses be left out a couple weeks prior to the evaluation. As far as the, uh, the final measurements, um, gas permeable lenses need to be left out two weeks per decade of wear. So please uh, make sure that your patients are aware when they come to the office to, uh, not to have their contact lenses in. Important to remember that IOL pow uh, power is calculated using two important measurements typically from the IOL master, the axial length and the corneal curvature. We want to ensure the most accurate measurements for the curvature so leaving contact lenses out for the appropriate amount of time gives us the truest measurements, which hopefully translate, translate into the most predictable view, visual acuity. Not all patients want to admit that they have cataracts. This is the denial phase. The cataract consultation with a cataract specialist consists of many things, starting with a general history. We want to hear in the patient's own words the visual disturbances that they experience, the lifestyle changes that they are coping with, like I stopped going out at night because I can't see the drive or I can't follow the golf ball anymore. Uh, the night glare, halos, and starbursts are the most common complaints. Most insurance companies need to see either best corrected visual acuity at 2040 or worse, 
or 2040 or worse with glare testing. We do a manifest or a cycloplegic refraction to determine the change in the glasses prescription. The slit lamp exam obviously is to look at the cataract as well as the document, any abnormal findings, corneal scars, et cetera. The dilated exam will also document any concerns such as diabetic retinopathy, macular issues, uh, and any other retinal issues you wish to record. Obviously, we want to record the IOP measurements as well. There are a slew of diagnostic tests that we perform for a variety of reasons, mostly, mostly which allow us a better assessment of the overall visual health. This helps us to determine what type of IOL the patient is or is not a candidate for. The macular OCT, along with the dilated fundus exam, helps us detect and rule out any retinal or macular pathologies. We've probably all seen a picture of the macular OCT. Um, so we can see thickness, we can see um, the uh, different aspects of the macula. And for especially multifocal lenses, we need a pristine macula. Corneal topography in our office, we use the Penicam, gives us a lot of information regarding the cornea, including the amount of corneal astigmatism and the amount of spherical aberration. Spherical aberration occurs when all incoming light rays focus at different points after passing through the cornea. This can be a natural phenomenon or enhanced by LASIK surgery. This is important in discussing with the patient premium lenses such as toric and multifocal lenses. Uh, a typical Pentacam image, um, there's probably 20 or 30 different images that you can look at. This is the cataract pre-op image um, in the bottom right-hand corner, which I believe we can enlarge. Um, you can see where it says um, spherical aberration, and that's a number that we look for um, to assess whether somebody is not or is a good candidate for um, multifocal IOLs. The IOL master measures axial length and corneal astigmatism, the two main components in calculating the IOL power. The IOL master is the gold standard for IOL calculations. Again, the IOL master gives us a lot of information, corneal curvatures, um, axial length, white to white. So there's a lot of information that we can pick up from the IOL master. Again, the gold standard in determining um, the power of an IOL lens. A healthy tear film is important in securing accurate corneal measurements. Many cataract patients are put on artificial tears four to six times a day and asked to come back for repeat IOL and Pentacam measurements. We want to ensure the most accurate corneal measurements to achieve the best visual outcome. A healthy tear film can also enhance vision after cataract surgery, especially with the implantation of the multifocal lens. We often need to repeat some of these measurements prior to calculating the final IOL power. We do a, a lot of measurements on the day of the uh, consultation, but sometimes they need to be repeated. If contact lenses have not been out of their eyes long enough, or if they have insufficient tear film, will bring the patients back to repeat the IOM master and the Pentacam. For all premium lenses, all toric and multifocal lenses, we repeat the IOM master and the Pentacam as well. And of course, if we are not confident in the initial measurements, we will repeat these measurements. The main reason for the repeat of the measurement is for consistency. Any error in the measurements can translate into a refractive surprise. And guess who holds the patient's hands with these refractive surprises? Uh, we as the optometrists do, and um, we just have to educate them that these things happen and eventually send them back to the surgeon. So when in doubt, you want to measure twice and cut once, and the patients certainly appreciate this. Now that the cataract surgeon has made the definitive diagnosis of a cataract, we need to educate the patient. These patients are put through a very thorough consultation, including the comprehensive eye exam, the diagnostic testing, the explanation of cataracts and cataract surgery. So now it's time to educate regarding the cataract experience, as well as their vision and surgical choices. This is a lot of information to process in one day. Some offices do the education on a different visit, but we choose in our office to do this all at the same visit. 
especially with COVID protocol in place, minimizing the visits is more convenient and safer for most. If not able to attend the consultation, we often have the spouse, children, or decision maker listen on, on a speakerphone so nothing gets lost in the translation. The patient has received the cataract packet, reviewing many of the talking points prior to their consult. Many have watched the videos sent to them regarding cataract surgery, lens options, and surgical options. So when we discuss these options with them, they have had the op opportunity to preview the information. So let's briefly re review each section of the educational process. I hate to use these words, but this is where I dumb it down when I talk to them about cataract surgery. The surgeon has just gone through their explanation of describing a cataract and explaining the surgical process. I often watch the patient's eyes while they're listening to the surgeon and can imagine what they are thinking as a surgeon often speaks from a medical perspective. I try to make my two minute explanation a very positive experience since all they hear is the word surgery. I bring out a model of the eye, give a quick anatomy lesson and show them a clear lens in the model eye and then a yellow cloudy lens in the model model eye. When the light rays pass through the cloudy lens, the image reaching the retina is distorted, causing the night glare, halos, and starbursts, which contributes to the decreasing quality of vision. I show them that a cataract, that, that cataract surgery is the removal of the cloudy lens, and it needs to be replaced with a clear artificial lens, and the power of that lens, we can correct the vision any way they want to. Um, three facts that I always mention. One, uh, we only need to do this once, cataract surgery, we only need to do it once. You only get one cataract per eye per lifetime. The second is, however we fix your vision, the vision will not change. And the third is, once the lens is in your eye, we cannot make any changes. This is not 100% true, but they need to hear that we cannot make any changes. The vision options that I discuss with every patient, um, they're pretty obvious. One, we can correct both eyes for distance. Uh, they will have good distance vision, but we'll need reading glasses for all near activities three feet and closer. The second is to correct both eyes for computer or reading, and they will need glasses for the distance. My guess is that about 5% of the patients choose this option mainly because I, uh, I am biased towards correcting both eyes for distance. I think it's easier to throw on a pair of reading glasses than it is to wear glasses full time. However, this is obviously not a medical decision. This is a decision that the patient needs to make based on their lifestyle and their habitual um, Rx. <clears throat> we also discuss monovision, but I seldom recommend it unless the patient has successfully had monovision LASIK or contact lenses. As we age, depth perception becomes more important for balance and monovision can negatively impact depth perception. I discuss EDOF or multifocal or extended depth of focus lenses that correct the vision for distance and the design of the lens expands the range of vision to see up to about 16 or 18 inches. If they are not a candidate for this lens as determined by the ophthalmologist exam, uh, I still mention the multifocal lens but tell them that they are not a good candidate. You don't want one of their friends bragging about their cataract surgery and that they can drive to the restaurant without glasses and read the menu without glasses. They need to know that they are not a good candidate for these lenses. I educate them regarding astigmatism. This can be a very tricky topic for those that have had large amounts of astigmatism in their glasses or contact lens, they know all about it. For those that have never been told they have astigmatism or think that they have never been corrected for it, I go back to basics and educate them. And remember, for cataract purposes, we are not concerned about any lenticular astigmatism as we are obviously removing the lens and its associated astigmatism. We are concerned about the corneal astigmatism, and that is what needs to be neutralized for clear vision. Um, if there is less than a half diopter of corneal astigmatism, uh, there is no need to correct uh, the astigmatism as it will be insignificant in, in affecting the vision. If there is between a half a diopter and a diopter of astigmatism on the cornea, uh, arcuate incisions can be made manually or with a laser to reduce the effect of astigmatism. For any amount of corneal astigmatism greater than a diopter, the toric IOL provides the most predictable vision. And of course, if the patient chooses not to correct for the astigmatism, the astigmatism can be corrected in glasses after the cataract surgery. The multifocal lens, the extended depth of focus lens, the trifocal and the accommodating IOL all provide for a wider range of vision than the monofocal. 
They allow the patient to see in the distance, mid-range, and near. Uh, they each have unique properties which provide optimal vision for different patients depending on their preferred range of vision. But for today's discussion, I will lump them all into one category and we would just call them multifocal lenses. The advantages of these lenses is that they extend the range of vision from the distance correction to about uh, 16 or 18 inches. This makes the patient less dependent on glasses. However, I never use the word eliminate glasses. The disadvantage of these lenses is that the quality of vision, especially in the distance at night, can be slightly compromised. About 10% of these patients see, see rings around lights at night. Most of these patients adapt to this over time, but they need to make an informed decision with this knowledge. As new lenses come on the market, the nighttime issues seem to have improved and the range of clear vision has widened, meaning that we're able to bring it in closer um, to our face. So that will continue to happen. If the spherical aberration as measured by the Pentacam is greater than 0.4 microns, the patient is not a good multifocal candidate. If angle kappa, as measured by the Iowa master, is greater than 0.5 millimeters, the patient is not a good multifocal candidate. If the patient is very critical of a quarter diopter and astigmatism or a few degrees on the axis when doing a refraction, or they are severely type A regarding their vision, or you just think that the multifocal IOL is not a good fit for the patient, this patient is definitely not a good candidate. We need to put a little proact we need to be a little proactive in our psychological assessment um, of these patients because multifocal IOLs are not the perfect solution. We cannot create a 20-year-old eye. However, we can provide the best medical advice that will create a wide range of vision and minimize the need for vision correcting glasses. <clears throat> Once we reviewed the different vision options with the patient, I then educate them on the two different ways the surgery is performed. I briefly describe the manual method using a blade to enter the eye. Then the surgeon performs phaco emulsification to break the lens into small fragments and vacuum the lens out of the eye piece by piece. Then through that same opening, the IOL is placed inside the eye and manipulated into position. The opening made does not require any sutures. I also educate them that on laser assisted cataract surgery, which incorporates the use of a laser to do some of the key steps of cataract surgery. With the laser, we you can project an image of the eye up on the computer screen and calculate on the screen the best axis to make the incision. The laser will make the incision with better precision than doing it manually. The laser will also break the lens or fragment, or fragment the lens outside of the eye using less energy inside of the eye compared to the manual FACO. It also allows for more precise placement of the lens in the eye, which is critical for some of the premium lenses. Finally, the laser can be programmed to make precise arcuate incisions, which can effectively correct between a half and a diopter of astigmatism. This chart reviews some of the benefits I just mentioned regarding the benefits of laser-assisted cataract surgery. Feel free to reference this at any time. There is some controversy amongst cataract surgeons whether the laser is any safer than manual surgery. The faster surgeons who operate quickly and with little time between surgeries feels like the laser slows them down. And when doing 20 or more cases in a morning, every minute counts. In my opinion, it is not less safe than manual. Um, it is definitely a more precise and predictable way of doing the procedure, and it can correct for small amounts of astigmatism. So I recommend it when appropriate. Um, I'm gonna show you a three minute video on laser assisted cataract surgery versus manual cataract surgery. The traditional method of removing a cataract along with implantation of an intraocular lens is one of the safest and most successful procedures performed in medicine today. Now, a technological breakthrough with laser cataract surgery is available that has significantly improved the precision of several of the most critical steps in cataract surgery. With laser cataract surgery, your surgeon will customize your procedure to your unique visual needs, resulting in better visual outcomes and potentially making cataract surgery even safer. With traditional cataract surgery, incisions are created with a blade, while with laser cataract surgery, they may be performed with the precision of a femtosecond laser. If a patient has pre-existing astigmatism, arc-like incisions in the outer margins of the cornea can be made to correct the astigmatism. 
Traditional cataract surgery requires a blade, while with laser cataract surgery, these incisions are performed with the laser. To remove the cataract, an opening must be made in the thin capsular membrane that surrounds the lens. This step is called the capsularexis. Studies have shown that less than 10% of manual capsularexi, which are made with a bent or shaped needle, have been able to achieve the same accuracy that is produced when they are made with the laser. The consistently precise laser-controlled capsularexis contributes to better lens positioning and therefore more predictable visual results, which is especially important with advanced technology IOLs. Once the outer capsular tissue is opened, the lens must be split into manageable size pieces for removal. Traditional FACO emulsification uses ultrasonic energy to divide the natural lens into quadrants. This step is now performed in an instant and with much less energy with the femtosecond laser. With both traditional and laser cataract surgery, the fragmented pieces of the cataract are vacuumed from the eye with phaco emulsification. However, with laser cataract surgery, the femtosecond laser actually softens the lens so less ultrasonic energy is required to remove the cataract. This means there is less stress to the delicate fibers and membrane that hold the intraocular lens in place. Once the cataract is removed, the intraocular lens of your choice is then inserted into the same membrane that held your natural lens. The small incisions are usually self-sealing and requires no stitches. The entire procedure takes only 15 to 20 minutes. So we play that video for all patients that come in to, for their evaluation. Um, and it just gives them a good perspective on manual cataract surgery versus laser cataract surgery. It makes the discussion of out-of-pocket costs for that part of the procedure a little bit easier because they are pretty geared up that they, uh, most of them prefer to use the laser-assisted cataract surgery. Which leads me into the next portion um, where they meet with the surgical coordinator. Insurance companies pay for the medical part of cataract surgery. They do not pay to fix the vision. I, so I repeat the, the, the patient's visual options, this time applying out-of-pocket costs with each visual option. And I have them meet with a surgical counselor to discuss the non-medical side of cataract surgery. Uh, they talk about schedules, what happens day of and day after the surgery, the need for a surgical pre-op exam, they review the eye drop schedule and any other non-medical discussions that are needed. This is where every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Uh, the patient must be sure what vision they are expecting and it is laid out in specific detail where they must sign their name in agreement with the plan. Since out-of-pocket costs are involved and most of these outcomes are permanent, we are very meticulous about this. We're also particular to find out if these patients were referred by an outside OD. This is where Ida will make sure that your patient is scheduled for their consult, contacted by the office, and attached to your name, the referring OD. We want to honor the referring OD's co-management wishes and make sure co-management fees are properly, uh, properly distributed. Please contact Ida with any questions, concerns, and certainly referrals. This is just a sample of the uh, post-op drop schedule that we use. Depending on insurance, we use generics, brand names, or a combination. There will be a time in the near future when we trust compound pharmacies 100%, and we will be able to inject the month's worth of drops into the eye at the time of surgery, and the often confusing eye drop schedule will become obsolete. This will be a huge step in the cataract, ro cataract world. We unfortunately are not there yet. Uh, Post-operative restrictions are obvious. I tell the patients to follow the rules for their best outcome and to use common sense. I know of a cataract surgeon at the one-week follow-up appointment, he would look into the slut lamp and ask the patient if they rubbed their operated eye any time in the past week. Most of them sheepishly admitted to at least once rubbing their eye. He used this as an excuse in case there were any complications that occurred and kind of put it on them that they rubbed their eye. Uh, I obviously have little respect for this ophthalmologist. 
Uh, this consent to co-manage form, I believe, is required by Medicare to disclose to the patient that there is a financial relationship between a cataract surgeon, or in our case, cats and eye group, and the co-managing doctor. The cataract consult is a long, long process. I always offer a repeat class via a phone call if they have questions. Uh, I'd say one in 10, call me back, and that's okay because I want them uh, to have the best information and the most informed decision that they can, whatever they choose for their vision. When is it proper time for the cataract surgeon to refer the patient back to the co-managing doctor after cataract surgery? Uh, the answer typically is once the patient is considered stable. If both eyes are being operated on, Katzen usually does the one-day post-op on the first eye and the one-week post-op on the first eye. There are certain diagnostic tests that we may need to repeat, and they must meet with the surgical coordinator to review the pre-op routine for the second eye. The surgical coordinator goes through the checklist that we just showed you for the second eye. Once the second eye is operated on, we do the one-day post-op on the second eye. Assuming all is stable, the patient is returned to the co-managing doctor for the one week post-op of the second eye and then the two month visit for both eyes. I tell the patient uh, this two month visit is their graduation day from cataract surgery. The main reason for day one post-op is to measure IOP. If the pressure is low, which is very rare, we must suspect a wound leak, which we will discuss in a few minutes. Um, if the pressure is high, it is usually caused by viscoelastic fluid being retained in the anterior ch chamber, which we will also discuss. We obviously check on day one, we check the vision, we look at the surgical com component to make sure that the incision is intact, to make sure that the IOL is centered and not dislocated, and there is not severe inflammation in the anterior chamber. We review the medicine drops again, review the restrictions again, and reassure the patient. We have them stopped in the optical department to have the lenses of the operated eye removed from their glasses. Um, this way, if they need some binocular vision, um, they will have the vision, assuming it's correcting for distance, from the operated eye and the vision out of the glasses um, in the unoperated eye. It looks a little strange. Sometimes in high myopes, they uh, struggle with this um, and will function better without glasses. In any event, it's for a short time and we just have to give the patient the best opportunity to, to get by during that time. The one week post-op is very similar to the one day post-op where the pressure is of utmost importance. We want to ensure that they are not having any IOP spikes from the, care, from the steroid drops. Careful analysis of the anterior chamber will usually reveal a very quiet eye with minimal cells and flare, clear corneal incisions and a well-centered lens. A careful manifest refraction is done to ensure there are no refractive surprises, which would alert the surgeon to double check the IOL calculations for the second eye. Any suspicious refractions should be addressed prior to the second eye surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the two month post-op is what I call graduation day. This is the last scheduled visit for their cataract surgery. The same post-op post tests are performed Final glasses can be prescribed for distance, near, or progressives are needed as well. Although many do not dilate the patient at the two month window, it is very important to do so. We want to ensure that the lens, the macula, and other ocular structures are evaluated post cataract surgery. The reason that many choose not to dilate is they say that when the vision is best corrected in 2020, there should be no internal issues and they just choose not to do it. We all practice within our comfort zone, but do what you think is appropriate. However, the standard of care is to dilate the eye at the two month visit. Um, yearly routine dilated eye exams should be performed on an, obviously on an annual basis. Um, there's a lot of things other than vision that we want to um, follow these patients with and um, they've been in your chair for many, many years and you wanna continue with that. Regarding post-op complications, the good news is that the majority of cataracts uh, of cataract surgery are routine without the complications. 
Those that are not routine are typically easy to get back on track. However, those that need to be referred back to the ophthalmologist often need to be done in a very timely manner. We need to know when to, when to treat and when to refer. Toxic anterior segment syndrome, endophthalmitis, and retinal detachments should be referred to the cataract surgeon or the retinal surgeon as soon as we notice them. This will ensure that the most urgent treatment will occur and will hopefully lead to a quicker resolution. Toxic anterior segment syndrome, or TAS, is a result of a sterile, non-infectious, acute, usually within the first 24 hours, infection of the anterior segment. It is usually caused by a contamination of the surgical equipment or the BSS solution. Symptoms include a red, painful eye with decreased vision, light sensitivity, a fixed dilated pupil, and severe inflammation. We need to distinguish this from endophthalmitis, with the main difference being TAS occurs in the first 24 hours and endophthalmitis occurs two to seven days post-op. I have never seen TAS, um, but once I see an angry, uncomfortable red eye with poor vision post-cataract surgery, I will immediately refer this back to the cataract or a retinal surgeon. TAS is treated with aggressive topical steroids every hour, then tapered with improvement. Most cases are resolved within a few weeks before any serious damage occurs. If not resolved within six weeks, permanent corneal edema can occur, possibly leading to the need for a corneal transplant. Uh, remember, uh, when you see something where the patient is this uncomfortable, send it back to the uh, surgeon immediately. Endophthalmitis feels very similar to TAS from a patient perspective. The symptoms are similar. Painful red eye with swollen lids, decrease in vision, with a main subjective difference being that endophthalmitis takes two to seven days to rear its ugly head. This is usually precipitated by a, precipitated by a phone call from the patient um, or the patient just showing up in your exam chair not feeling very well. Uh, the main cause of endophthalmitis is a bacterial or fungal infection, which is introduced from outside of the body at the incision site. This inflammation affects the anterior chamber and the vitreous and needs immediate referral to the retinal specialist for an intravitreal injection or antibiotic or, or anti, of antibiotic and antifungals and or a vitrectomy. Again, these angry eyes with poor vision and a lot of pain need immediate referral. We all know the signs and symptoms of a retinal detachment. Although rare after cataract surgery, every patient is educated that this can be a complication of cataract surgery. Flashes, floaters, curtain or veil across the vision are all symptoms of retinal detachment. I would dilate them, confirm the detachment, and refer to a retina person. If I did not see the detachments, I would still refer these patients to a retinal person. Clinical signs of a wound leak are poor vision, low IOP, usually less than eight, epiphora, and a shallow anterior chamber. The excessive tearing is due to the incision and the open wound. The best way to identify uh, a wound leak is to inspect the incision with fluorescein and a cobalt blue filter. You will see a slow flow out from the wound. Um, this is known as Seidel positive. If the, if, if the uh, leak is mild, it will heal on its own. However, I would put a bandage contact lens on the eye to, pr pr to promote re-epithelialization, make the patient feel a little bit more comfortable. If the anterior chamber is flat and the IOP is constantly low, you should refer this to a surgeon. It may need a suture. Antibiotic drops need to be continued and the patient needs to be seen daily until this is healed. Non-emergent complications are such because they are not sight-threatening and are not painful. Um, if not handled in the uh, optometrist's office, they will eventually be referred back to the cataract surgeon and remedy there. Um, optometrists that have access to sample IOP lowering drops can manage the IOP spike, um, and the cataract surgeon will handle 
the other non-emergent complications, which you will see shortly. The main reason for one day post-op, like I said earlier, is to check the intraocular pressure. Viscoelastic fluid, which is used in cataract surgery, is a viscous fluid injected into the anterior chamber. Sometimes this viscoelastic fluid is retained in the trabecular meshwork, impeding the drainage of the aqueous, thus causing a rise in IOP. Um, my rule of thumb for one day IOP measurements after cataract surgery, um, 30 and less, just recheck the pressure in a week. If the IOP is between 30 and 40, treat with a glaucoma lowering drop such as Combigan twice a day. I usually put two drops in the patient's eye in the office, let them sit for about 45 minutes and recheck the pressure. Once it has dropped under 30, I let them go home, continue the drops twice a day and recheck them again the next day. Um, hopefully the pressure will be down um, at that point. If it's still in an uncomfortable range, we refer that back to the ophthalmologist. If the pressure is 40 or higher on day one, you will see some corneal edema with associated decrease in vision. Uh, some of us are, are, are comfortable burping the wound, basically pressing on the incision, allowing the expression of the aqueous. This simple procedure will immediately lower the pressure. Uh, it is very important to recheck that IOP at that time and then check it again after 30 minutes to make sure the pressure uh, has been resolved. I would check it again the next day. If you're not comfortable with any pressure above 30, refer it back to the surgeon. Just don't let the patient go unattended with pressures above 30. Retained cortical material is a fragment of the lens that remains in the eye after cataract surgery. It can look like a lens fragment or it can look like a soft, fluffy cloud of tissue that should not be there. This may cause increased IOP and decreased vision. This needs referral back to the cataract or the retinal surgeon for surgical removal. If small enough, a YAG laser can treat this retained cortical material. We've all seen the visual blur and the funky over-refraction when a toric contact lens has rotated in the eye. The same thing happens if a toric IOL has rotated in the eye. The only difference is that you cannot manually rotate the IOL back into position at the slit lamp. Uh, when a toric lens has been implanted and there are still a lot of residual refractive astigmatism, especially at an oblique axis, uh, just assume that the lens has rotated in the eye. Um, I dilate the patient. I look at the, at the um, axis of the actual lens in the eye, and I compare that to the intended axis that that lens should be. When they do not align, um, refer this back to the surgeon for him or her to surgically rotate the lens in the operating room. Assuming that the proper IOL was chosen initially, rotating this lens will solve the visual problem. Posterior capsular opacification, or haze, is the most common complication of cataract surgery. Cells grow in the posterior capsule, causing it to thicken and become opacified. Patients describe it like their cataract has come back, causing a similar visual distortion. This usually occurs within the first three months post-op, um, this is sent back to the surgeon for a YAG capsulotomy, which is a laser that permanently removes the opacified material and returns the eye to pre-opacification vision. Refractive surprises are unexpected visual results and refractions. This can be blamed on poor quality control of the IOL, which is very, very, very rare. Actually, the ophthalmologist choosing, picking out the wrong lens, um, the lens moving slightly forward or backwards in the uh, capsule. These surprises make no sense on day one, on day seven, or day 60. Most ophthalmologists, most cataract surgeons will not do the backtracking to see what caused the surprise because it still needs to be fixed. Depending on the timing and the surgeon's preference, an IOL exchange or PRK enhancement are the best options to fix this vision. Cataract surgery should provide the patient with more clear, less distorted vision where nighttime glare has been greatly reduced and colors are more bright and vivid. Every human being will get cataracts if they live long enough. 
being part of the cataract process for our patients is what allows us to stand out in our care and our genuine concern for our patients. Each patient has different lifestyle needs, different visual desires, and different financial priorities regarding their eyes and their vision. Being part of the cataract decision-making spectrum for our patients is very gratifying as a clinician. Most are extremely happy with their choices, especially when they are well-informed of the surgical process and educated regarding their vision choices. From the very first complaint of slightly decreased quality of vision until graduation day from the cataract world, we can make a difference in our patients' lives and maintain these patients' visual needs for many years. Thank you.